Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. We're going to get into part two of the Great Northern War documentary by Kings and Generals. Um, we did part one just a day or two ago. I'll put the link for it somewhere up there, but I'm anxious to get into it. This is a, you know, an interesting conflict that is through a time period where uh, European history is changing very quickly. So anxious to get into it. Let's get started. With the stunning victory at the Battle of Narva, the Swedish army confirmed that it was a force to be reckoned with. However, the war was not over. Augustus II of Saxony, the elected monarch of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, still remained, and Charles was eager to defeat him as well. Charles, in spite of his young age, presented himself as a capable commander, and it became evident that his adversaries gravely underestimated him. Now, the young king wanted to bring the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to its knees. While Charles and his forces settled around Dorpat for winter quarters, news of his victory at Narva created shockwaves throughout Europe. Peter the Great, realizing that Augustus II might already be trying to enter peace negotiations with Sweden, offered the Saxon elector financial and military help in return for staying in the war. By the beginning of the campaigning season, in May, Reinforcements from Sweden arrived in Revel, and they joined the main Swedish army in the middle of June. Having united his forces, Charles set off for Riga on June 17th. However, as the Russians frequently raided and harassed Swedish positions, he was forced to leave behind 6,000 men in Ingria and Estonia, under the command of Schlippenbach. Although the Saxon army besieged Riga from the beginning of the war, they did not have the manpower or the equipment to take the well-fortified city. After learning of the arrival of the Swedish army in Livonia in late 1700, the Saxon troops retreated beyond the Duna River, modern Daugava, for winter quarters. During the winter season, the Saxons, under the command of Steinau, heavily fortified their side of the river in preparation for a possible Swedish crossing. The Swedish army arrived near Riga on July 14th, and Charles, being aware that making a direct crossing would be a huge risk and quite costly in manpower, opted to weaken the Saxon defence first. Several hundred of his horsemen, as well as part of Riga's garrison, were ordered to head up river towards Kockenhusen, a seemingly ideal place for a crossing. As a result... It's kind of crazy how even throughout time defensive works have you know like things like rivers play an instrumental role in a country's defenses in where they put their defensive line with everything that has changed over time as far as militaries and armies and things like that are concerned that really hasn't right like i I immediately thought of World War One because that was the war where everything was different. All of the tactics had to be thrown out. The offensive charge was, was gone, basically. Cavalry was not even usable. And still, Rivers Ford defensive lines were used constantly. Um, it's just one of those things. Like, if you have a defensive front on the backside of a river... There really is no good way for, you know, an offensive army to to cross, right? Like they're really, no matter how they, they kind of try to do it, they're at a disadvantage. I just thought that was interesting that it doesn't really matter what time period you look at. That is like a, a specific thing that is the same. Well, Steiner was forced to stretch his forces thin to cover both the possible crossing points at Kockenhausen and the one near Riga. On the evening of the 18th, Swedish forces embarked on transport ships at Fassenholm and began their crossing. Meanwhile, engineers were ordered to create a makeshift floating bridge across the river as well. The crossing Swedish army, led by Charles himself, consisted of around 7,000 grenadiers, 
and only 100 cavalry, while their Saxon counterpart had a 20,000 strong army on their side. Wow. As soon as the transport boats reached the middle of the river, the Saxon artillery started firing at them. However, the artillery barrage would be ineffective. At the same time, the Swedish artillery, placed both on their side of the river and on two riverboats, began shelling the Saxon redoubts. Awaiting the Swedish assault, a Saxon army under the command of Steinau drew up in two lines between the two redoubts. The army that Steinau managed to gather in such a short period of time consisted only of about 3,500 men, and it was made up mostly of infantry and a small amount of cavalry on the flanks. Charles, seeing that such a force was descending upon his men, drew up around 3,000 grenadiers and prepared for the Saxon assault. The Saxons attacked the Swedish army furiously, however their assault was halted and they were forced to retreat after the Swedish army fired several volleys. This allowed for more Swedish troops to disembark and join the main body of the army, while at the same time more of Steinau's men joined the fight as well. Undaunted by their initial failure, the entirety of the Saxon infantry drew up in a line and charged, meeting the same fate once again. On their third try, the Saxon cavalry tried to attack Charles' right flank, however a part of the Swedish cavalry that just disembarked managed to push it back. This pattern of Saxon assaults and retreats dragged on until 7am on the next day, when the Swedish army captured the first redoubt. What, what a crazy, like, geez, that was, that whole plan of attack was insane. Like, think about it. You have a well-fortified, entrenched enemy on one side of a river. You're, you're trying to figure out how you're, you're going to get over there how you're going to kind of even the advantage here because you are, you know, you're in a bad spot, right? You're in a bad spot and there really are no good options. Your option is floating bridge, barges, you take over as many men as you can get, but still, even if you could get all of your men over there, it's still, you're crossing a river against a well-fortified enemy that's entrenched and and your decision is like nope going going all out going straight across like open front that that's just that that whole plan of action is very much i feel like in in charles the 12th kind of character and personality but looking at it you know on paper you're like this is insane this is insane Steinau deemed it impossible to defend such a position and subsequently ordered a retreat. The majority of the Saxon army retreated unscathed to the forts of Dunamunda and Kobrin, as bad weather prevented the Swedish engineers from finishing the bridge in time so that their cavalry could assault the Saxon army. Still, the Saxons lost more than 2,000 in this action, while Charles's casualties were around 500. In the following days, Kobrun and Dunamunda fell to the Swedish army, with Kockenhusen and the rest of Livonia and Kurland falling into their hands in the next few weeks. A small Russian army under Repnin that was sent by Peter to support the Saxons retreated to the east without participating in the battle. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been neutral up until that point, with the majority of their magnates opposing the war with Sweden and using the liberum veto to avoid it. Charles himself was in a position of power at that moment and could have signed a peace treaty with Augustus. Aware of the elector's deceitful nature, the young Swedish king knew that there would be no peace with Poland for as long as Augustus remained king. Therefore, dethroning him seemed like the only option to secure Livonia and advance to Russia unhindered. It is also speculated that Charles had taken a personal disliking towards Augustus, as the two of them had quite opposite personalities. 
the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was far from what it once was. The cracks on the internal political machine of the state were evident. Many of the magnates did not support their elected king, and some were even openly against him. In the beginning of autumn in 1701, as soon as Charles started advancing into Kurland, That whole idea of the nobles of an area being able to outright veto the monarch is wildly bizarre to me, right? Like, where, where do they, in what way do they establish that power? Because you think about, like, other European monarchies, the whole thing was the, the monarch has power and really nobody else does. I mean, there was oligarchies, obviously, and stuff, but as far as, like, final decision... That was in the hands of the monarch. So it's it's very interesting to me. And I get kind of having like a... Because I had some comments talk about how Sweden's... I don't know if it was their parliament or if it was their nobles or, or what it was. But how they kind of had a, a give and take relationship with the monarch too. But the idea that the monarch could say, okay, we are for sure doing this. And then the nobles of an area be like, nope, we're, we're vetoing it. That just seems historically crazy to me. He was met by several minor Lithuanian nobles, asking him to avoid taking control of their lands in exchange for their logistical support. Lithuania was, at the time, divided between two powerful noble families, the Oginski and the Sapieha. Augustus himself was at odds with the Sapieha family and allowed the Oginski to raid their lands with impunity. The two counts of Sapieha, seeing an opportunity to protect their lands and expand their influence, met with Charles as well, offering their support in exchange for protection against Oginski and the dethroning of Augustus. Although minor Swedish expeditions took place in Lithuania in the last few months of 1701, with Kaunas and Vilnius falling by January, no significant result was achieved as Oginski refused to give open battle and was still harassing the Swedish forces. By February of 1702, Charles returned to Kurland and started making preparations for his advance on Warsaw. Seeing the gravity of the situation, Augustus called for a diet in the capital, asking the Polish nobility for support. The diet did not resolve any crucial issues, with many magnates using that chance to voice their dissatisfaction with Augustus. Nevertheless, the nobility agreed to send five of their members to Charles to try and negotiate a peace once again, this time with the Dutch Republic's mediation. The five diplomats, some nobles and some members of the Catholic Church met with Charles on several occasions. The divisions in the ranks of the Commonwealth were seen here as well. At first, the diplomats tried to convince Charles to agree to their peace terms. However, after several days, they started bickering among themselves, much to the Swedish king's annoyance. Incensed by their disrespect, Charles halted all further negotiations and moved for Warsaw determined to take it. Having learned of the Swedish king's inflexibility, Augustus decided to leave Warsaw for the old capital of Krakow. With Warsaw falling to the Swedes by late spring, Augustus attempted a last-ditch effort to secure peace and sent the Archbishop of Gniezno, Cardinal Radziejewski. Unknown to Augustus, the Cardinal had already exchanged several letters with Charles assuring him of his friendly intentions. Whether the Cardinal intended to betray Augustus at that point still remains unclear. Furthermore, after spending some time with Charles, the Cardinal advised him against dethroning the King, as the Polish people would not only change their attitude towards the Swedes, but also that they would never view the new King as legitimate. As Augustus still was not decisively defeated, Charles did not give too much thought to the Cardinal's advice, but focused on the war instead. 
It was the middle of June when Charles began his march towards Krakow. He reached the town of Kielce, where he learned that Augustus linked up with the Polish army under Lubomirski at Sandomierz. After an unsuccessful Saxon ambush on a Swedish scouting unit, the Swedes learned of Augustus's position at Klisov. On the morning of the 17th of July, Charles departed from Kielce at the head of his army, reaching the village of Apietza, which was four kilometers away from Klisov, on the evening of the same day. So, didn't it say at the beginning of this that Russia was the one that was pushing them to stay involved in the war? What? Where has Russia been? They just, they saw the beat down at the beginning and were like, all right, never mind. Like, we were going to help, but, you know, what can you do? That just, that seems crazy to me. Sweden has just been on a rampage here. Uh, you know, on the other side, it's been nothing but retreats and, and attempts at peace. And I'm pretty sure that's what it said at the beginning, right? That Russia was the one pushing everybody to <clears throat> to stay in the conflict, stay together. And now, you know, Sweden is just absolutely wrecking <laughs> everybody and Russia is nowhere to be found. Even though the Swedish army was smaller and lacked cavalry, Charles wanted to attack. Ultimately, he, he heeded the advice of his generals and waited for one more day for his cavalry to arrive. As the Swedish cavalry arrived on the 18th, so did rumors about a Saxon attack, which was supposed to take place on the morning of the 19th. However, the Saxon army had not turned up by 9 a.m., so Charles drew up his army and began marching towards their positions at Klisov. He had roughly 12,000 men at his disposal, with about 8,000 grenadiers and 4,000 cavalry, as well as four artillery pieces. The army was drawn up in two lines. The cavalry was placed on the wings and the infantry in the center. The right wing was commanded by Charles XII himself, the center by von Lewin, and the left wing by Duke Frederick IV of holstein gottorp The majority of the Swedish army advanced through the forest towards Klisov, with only the left wing taking the more open route. Just as the Swedish left arrived on the plains outside Klisov, they were noticed by a Saxon cavalry regiment that was led by Augustus. As the Saxon elector was confident that only a small unit was advancing towards his positions, he lowered his guard and did not take the threat seriously. Charles, seeing the element of surprise as critical, ordered his cavalry to lower their standards and the infantry to lower their pikes, just as they passed onto the plains outside Klisov. Augustus fell for that trap as well, and perceived the Swedish army as only a reconnaissance unit. The Saxon army consisted of 16,000 men, 9,000 of whom were infantry and 7,000 cavalry. Augustus also had an 8,000-strong Polish cavalry unit, consisting of 1,000 elite winged hussars, 3,000 panzerni, 500 dragoons, and 3,500 Cossacks and Wallachian light horse. Yeah, the winged hussars look dope. The, the, winged hussars the flanks. The left wing was led by von Tramper, the center by Schulenberg, and the right by von Fleming, while the Polish units on the far right were led by Lubomirski. Augustus's forces occupied the higher ground, where they placed their 46 artillery pieces, and their position was also additionally protected by a chevaux de frise. At noon. Did it say 46 artillery pieces? The Swedes have four and they have 46. Is that what they said? That is outrageous if, that, if those are the numbers. Charles ordered his right wing to pass around the woodlot in front of it from the left side. Also, the center and left wing to advance directly towards the Saxon. They look like they're in a pretty good defensive position here. They've got the... I don't want to say rivers, but the, the streams front and back, um, you know, they're up on a hill. They've got the cavalry out to each side. Um, 
they have kind of the dugout there in the middle with all of the artillery. Like they seem like they're in a good they seem like they're in a good defensive spot. I guess the issue with this spot would be if you're you know, if you get surprised, you're kind of trapped. Like it's it's good to keep, you know, others out, but if if you get, you know, if you get surprised here, it could it could get bad quickly. Some positions. Now aware that this was not just a reconnaissance unit, but the main Swedish army, Augustus ordered his artillery to fire on the Swedish forces. Right before the Saxon camp, there was a dense marsh from the village of Kokot to the village of Vizbitsa, which hindered the Swedish advance. The Saxons were in a very advantageous position at that point, their artillery wreaking havoc upon the Swedish army. Charles XII, seeing the absolute impossibility of attacking the enemy directly, ordered his army to wheel to the left, thereby taking higher ground and disengaging from the marshes. The Saxon army, now being forced to draw towards the right, left its advantageous positions on the high ground, and a part of it ended up in the marshes instead. At 2pm, the Swedish left wing began its attack. Just as Frederick IV was marching towards the Polish cavalry, he was struck by a cannonball and was taken to his tent, where he would die a few hours later. Now commanded by Welling, the Swedish left still charged the Polish cavalry thrice, completely crushing even the winged hussars and forcing the entire wing to rout. Afterwards, Charles took control of the left and began advancing towards the Saxon centre. Yeah, to avoid being outflanked, out the Saxon centre began a retreat. However, they... Yeah, that's what I was saying was like, if they get in your little, the little bubble you've got there, that could get dangerous very quickly. So that's probably a good call that as soon as you see the Polish cavalry get overrun, put, pull them out, get, get them out of there. Exposed themselves to the elite Swedish infantry in the center, which began firing destructive volleys at them, dealing massive casualties. The Saxon retreat was made even more difficult by the marshland which was behind their initial position and the Swedish soldiers used that opportunity to shoot as many of them down as possible. On the other side of the battlefield, the Saxon cavalry attacked the Swedish right wing. Though the Saxons initially had the upper hand there, they were repulsed by the Swedish right and were forced to retreat. As the main Saxon army had already routed, their left ran into the rest of the Swedish army on their retreat. The Saxon left bravely fought to escape from their encirclement, however they lost many men to the fire from the Swedish infantry in the process. In the end, the winning Swedish army lost less than 1,000 men, while the Saxons lost 3,700, 1,700 of whom were captured. The exact number of Polish casualties is unknown, however they are noted to have been great. The Swedish army also ended up in possession of the 46 Saxon artillery pieces and their war chest. So, how many artillery pieces is that for the Swedish at this point? I mean, they only had, what, four with them here? But between here and Narva, I, I mean, they've, they've got, they could literally build a ship with those artillery pieces. Augustus's downplaying of the danger which the Swedish army posed to his own cost him the advantageous initial position. That, combined with the superiority of the Swedish soldiers and Charles's tactical acumen, proved to be an insurmountable obstacle for the Saxon-Polish army. Augustus retreated with what was left of his army to Sandomierz, hoping to get more support from the Diet there, while on the 31st of July, Charles entered Krakow. The Battle of Klesov marks the last time that the famed winged hussars were used in battle. Symbolically, it would also mark the beginning of the end of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This decisive victory brought Charles one step closer to a complete victory, which seemed impossible less than two years ago. 
Not all was good for the Swedish though, as trouble was brewing in the north once again. But that is the story for our next documentary, which will come soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos will- Okay, so that was the second part of the Great Northern War. Man, there is, I mean, it, when it said that it looked impossible that Sweden could win this war, you know, two years ago, it really is crazy how how much, you know, they take so quickly. Like, how many uh, defeats they hand out to, to major powers and just how quickly they're moving. I'm sure if you are one of the powers that was in this agreement to, to fight the Swedes going into this, you've got to be looking now and saying, like, we're in a dangerous spot here. Like, if, if they can move that quickly through Poland or Polish-Lithuania, then, then they can move that quickly wherever they go. Um, I don't know. That's just, that's a very interesting kind of turn. Um, but anyway, this is good. I'll get to part three uh, sometime soon, in the next day probably. Uh, but as always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. I will see you all next time.